Hi folks, welcome to part three of our nervous system lecture. In this lecture we're going to talk about information transfer within neurons, which involves the movement of positively and negatively charged ions. So information transfer inside a nerve cell is electrical. Electricity is the movement of charged particles. Right, so it could be positively charged ions like calcium or sodium or potassium, or negatively charged ions like chlorine. In each of those is going to have a different effect. In general, the movement that the electrical charge this wave of electrical charge follows is from the dendrites to the soma to the accent hillock, which is the decision point about whether or not the signal is going to be passed on to another cell. There's the accent hillock right there at the beginning of the axon. So to understand how this happens, we have to learn about something called the membrane potential or the resting membrane potential. Um, then we can see how that is disturbed to create either an action potential or the graded potentials we talked about in the uh, video too. Now in the resting state, its resting state, the cell membrane of neurons and other cells as well is what we call polarized. What that means is that there is a separation of charges across the plasma membrane. We'll talk about how that happens in just a second. All right, but separation of charge is what polarization means. So the neuron is polarized and you know that opposite charges attract one another. So you end up with a situation where you have negative charges close to the surface of the axon as well as the rest of the plasma membrane and positive charges just on the other side of the membrane that are attracted there by the negative charge. It's almost like a battery except for until you get to the axon hillock there's no way to connect the circuit. The axon hillock is the first place we start to see voltage gated channels other than all the way down at the end of the axon and the axon terminals. Now the resting membrane potential is the result of primarily the result of two things. The first is the constant functioning of the sodium potassium pump that we talked about last week. So this is a molecular pump. It's an example of active transport, meaning you have to hydrolyze ATP in order for the pump to work. And this pump is set up in all animals so that three sodium, which is Na plus, three sodium ions are moved out of the cell for every two potassium ions that are moved into the cell. A difference of one doesn't seem like a lot, but over time you end up with a more and more negative inside compared to the outside. There are also a lot of proteins that have slight negative charges to them. So that's also contributing to the negative inside and then with reference to that positive outside, right? So that's how you have polarization. That's the baseline state that gives us our resting membrane potential. Now in order for a neuron to send a message on to another cell, a muscle or a neuron, you need to have enough 
change in electrical charge, enough disturbance, large enough disturbance to the resting membrane potential to reach a very particular change in potential. And when I say potential, what I mean is that there's a separation of charge, right? So the action potential has three parts to it once it gets started. The first is called depolarization, right? So if polarization means separation of charge. You add the D in front, that means that there's less separation of charge. Then we have a repolarization and then finally a hyperpolarization at the very end of the process. So beginning with the axon hillock, we have voltage gated sodium and potassium channels. Those voltage gated sodium channels only open when the axon hillock reaches what's referred to as the threshold potential which is negative 70 millivolts. You don't need to remember that number, but for those of you that care, there you go. What that, what happens, and that's what's shown here in the yellow, is depolarization. So if you look at the charge, the beginning of the axon, so we're looking partway through the action potential, right? We see the typical scenario, negative inside, positive outside. when there is sufficient change in polarization, the voltage gated sodium channels open, sodium which has been continuously pumped out of the cell, right, is going to rush in. So this is a channel, it's passive transport, but it's gated by a specific voltage. When those channels open, the sodium floods in to the axon and it temporarily reverses the polarity. So you've got suddenly, oops, suddenly you've got positive inside and negative outside. And that process proceeds all the way down the axon being so each little section of the axon depolarizes one after the other, sort of like knocking over, you know, setting a bunch of dominoes up. You hit the first one, they don't all fall at once. They fall, especially if you look at it in slow motion, you can see they fall one at a time. One thing that's important to remember is that action potentials are all or none. And what we mean by that is if an action potential is started, it stays, the change in voltage continues all the way down to the axon terminals without getting smaller in size. At the axon hillock is where that decision is taken, right? So the threshold potential happens when the combined changes associated with graded potentials are, meet this specific level, negative 55 millivolts. Once that happens, it triggers the opening of those voltage gated channels. So just like you can measure the amount of current flowing through an electrical circuit, you can stick an electrode in an axon and record changes in the movement of electricity over time. And that's what we're looking at in this graph. So we've got time on the x-axis. We're not going to worry about the scale here, but it's um, millis in thousandths of a second. And then we have the change in voltage across the membrane in millivolts on the y-axis. So we've got the resting membrane potential here, right, negative 70 millivolts. And then you might have small depolarizations that sum up 
to the threshold value, or perhaps they never do, in which case you don't get an action potential. But once you hit that threshold, the voltage gated channels open and there's this huge wave of depolarization. When you get to roughly 30 millivolts positive inside with respect to the outside, that stimulates the opening of voltage gated potassium channels and you have repolarization. So you're coming, the charge is becoming um, more different. The hyperpolarization phase is because, right, these events are actually happening across time. And the closing of the voltage gated channels is accomplished essentially by a, um, a tiny molecular ball that's on, looks like a chain actually, that swings up and closes the voltage gated channel. That takes some time. So you have hyperpolarization where it's actually your under resting membrane potential at that point. And so it's very difficult to get the neuron to fire or that section of the neuron to fire until you get back to resting membrane potential. So you've got the sodium potassium pump responsible for resting membrane potential. You have voltage gated sodium channels associated with depolarization, voltage gated potassium channels associated with repolarization, and then the hyperpolarization is a function of time for those channels to close, and then the resting membrane potential is restored by the, finally, by the sodium potassium pump. So in this short video, we're going to see the action potential is conducted section by section down the axon as each section of the membrane, axon membrane depolarizes and then repolarizes. Once the action potential reaches the axon terminals, that's the first place we've got voltage gated calcium channels. Those open, that allows calcium to flood in. That calcium influx leads to exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to the receptor which is a ligand gated either positive or negative ion channel that then causes a graded potential in the postsynaptic cell. So what starts an action potential is input from excitatory and inhibitory neurons or excitatory or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, right? If you have a positively charged ion, that is going to be depolarizing. Whereas if you have an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, you have an ion channel that's letting a negative charge. So the neuron is going to be less likely to fire. So all of the stimuli that come in, all of the different excitatory and inhibitory inputs, and there are thousands for each on each neuron, all of that input is summed up at the axon hillock. If a threshold value is of depolarization is reached, when all of that is well, the positive and negative charges come together at the axon hillock. If you get to threshold, then you're going to fire an action potential, right? If you don't, then you're below. Eventually the sodium potassium pump is going to return you to baseline. An inhibitory input is going to cause you to 
be hyperpolarized, which means you need an even bigger increase in positive charge to simulate an action potential. So to reiterate, excitatory neurotransmitters, excitatory inputs are depolarizing, right? If the cell is becoming less polarized, less negative inside with respect to the outside, that has to mean that you've had an influx of positive ions. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, on the other hand, are polarizing or hyperpolarizing. And that means that they're making the inside of the cell more negative than it was. There are many different neurotransmitters, right? These are some of the ones you might be familiar with. If you're not, don't worry about it. There's only one that you need to know about, and we're not even going to talk about it until we get to the muscular system. But I think it's interesting to note that different neurotransmitters are associated with different kinds of with different kinds of felt experience, right? Um, we really are our brain chemistry, right? Um, anyone who's taken antidepressants or perhaps used um, recreational drugs, I was looking for the word there, um, knows that you can alter your brain function fairly easily by putting different neurotransmitters into your system, right? Caffeine, for example, which is, I suppose, a recreational drug for some folks, um, is pleasurable in certain amounts because it leads to the increased transmission in neurons that use dopamine. Dopamine is a reward, sort of is associated, our brains read dopamine as, oh my God, that's good, that's a reward. Dopamine also stimulates the release of noradrenaline or norepinephrine as it's usually referred to in the nervous system. And in really high levels, right, you can feel really jittery. It's leading to increased epinephrine, or so-called adrenaline. Exactly the same molecule, we just use different words depending on whether we're talking about the substance as a neurotransmitter or as a hormone. So in this image, we have a slightly more complicated electrical recording from the axon hillock of a fictitious neuron, but makes the point, um, right? We've got time on the x-axis here and the change in voltage across the membrane here. Notice that the y-axis doesn't start at zero, right? Zero is someplace in here. The important number in terms of the neuron is negative 70 because that's the resting membrane potential. And then when you see the, where you see the green, we have excitatory inputs. So there's one little bump, there's one little bump. Oh, but then there's an inhibitory neuron that gives an input to the cell we're recording from and that allows negative charge into the cell. So now we're going back down toward membrane potential. And then we've got the sodium potassium pump working, no new inputs, but then we've got another excitatory input, another inhibitory input, and then finally one walloping big excitatory input that allows the cell to reach threshold. When it reaches threshold, you have depolarization, then repolarization, hyperpolarization, and then reestablishment of the resting membrane potential.
So we have the sodium potassium pump, right, for resting with resting membrane potential responsible for that. Where I've made the blue line here on the bottom, all of that, all of those inputs represent grade, graded potential. So smaller changes in the electrical activity of the cell. Once we end up at the axon hillock where you have the voltage gated channels, when that voltage reaches threshold, we've got voltage gated ion channels responsible for depolarization and repolarization, and then the sodium potassium pump takes over. So at the beginning of lecture two, I said that we needed to think about the different kinds of proteins embedded in the membrane of neurons, and hopefully you can now see why that's true. So let's look at this. All right, so I'm not going to go through re-identifying the neural structures, um, but I do think you guys should do that. Um, and I do want to go over where in the cell, in the stereotypical neuron, there are always exceptions, we find the different kinds of membrane proteins. So the sodium potassium pumps, ligand gated channels on the dendrites and on the soma. Sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels, starting with the axon hillock and then all the way down the axon and to the axon terminal. And then last but not least, calcium voltage-gated calcium channels. Those are found in the axon or synaptic terminals. All right. Next up, uh, an introduction to gross anatomy of the nervous system in video four.